are happy to present another exciting, thrilling, and fun episode of the OpenShift Commons briefings here today. My name is Michael Waite. I have finally moved out of my cabin in northern New Hampshire, and I'm back in my in my home office for the first time in, <clears throat> in eight months. It kind of feels a little bit strange. But today we are... We're happy to have Michael Villager here from Dynatrace. Michael Villager is their senior technical partner manager. Um, welcome, Michael. How are you today? I'm doing terrific. That's really good. What? Tell us a little bit about yourself. What? What? What is your role at Dynatrace? How long have you been there? What's your What's your claim to fame over there at Dynatrace? Yeah. So um, I, I've actually been with Dynatrace for almost seven years now uh, so I'm a I'm a long timer um, I was a customer for a couple of years before that uh, originally kind of brought over my background in uh, cloud and big data so I was a, a crazy person who decided to uh, use APM solutions to understand what was going on with uh, custom Java MapReduce like for folks that remember when Hadoop was a thing um, right. and uh, you know one of the things that uh, you know, I did many, many years ago, uh, for, for those of you on this call that are, you know, viewing the recording here that might remember uh, OpenShift V2, uh, I was the creator of the, the Dynatrace uh, OpenShift V2 cartridge that actually allowed us to uh, inject our Atmon agent into uh, JBoss cartridges. Uh, for those who kind of, you know, remember uh, the, the heady early days of OpenShift before it was Kubernetes based. Yeah, I was going to say that. That I was going to ask you. Say, hey, so do you have any experience with OpenShift? And you know, what what <clears> makes you what makes you that? So you already beat me to it. That that uh, that was a long time ago. Things are certainly a lot different. I mean, we made we kind of really bet the farm on, you know, making the big switch to 100% Kubernetes. And I think that was the right choice because it's really uh, starting to get you know Kubernetes obviously has become you know the mainstream way for 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 doing these sort of things. So. Um, you put together when when we were talking with your with your people at Dynatrace, we were like, hey, we want to we want to have you guys come on and be a part of our show today, but we're not looking for you know really in the weeds demos of okay, here let me pull up a, a, a terminal window and let's edit this config file together and see how thrilling it is. And so you actually put together. Um, a discussion here, something involving Minecraft. Is that correct? Yep. yep. So, so you know, I, I have a couple of different things uh, that that I'll be talking us through today. But you know, given given the context of of the year and 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 how it's been, um, a lot of folks like myself have been kind of spending time upgrading our our home labs and you know finding interesting things to do to to occupy ourselves when we can't really go anywhere uh, anymore. So this is <laughs> this is one of the things that I did, and and I want to kind of talk to folks about the journey. Well, that's that, that's pretty cool. Um, I, I would like to say that you know we're we are really happy to have Dinah Trace on here, and and thank you, um, Marcy, for for lining up Michael Villager. I, I know that this that the the content here is going to be pretty interesting. But you know the reason why we do this OpenShift Commons briefings and have companies like Dynatrace and, and others on here is because we at Red Hat have been working with Dynatrace for a long time to make sure that the Dynatrace software is fully tested and, and certified and supportable for the Red Hat platforms and specifically you know Red Hat OpenShift because when customers want to put you know their um, IT into production in a multi-cloud world. Everyone wants to make sure that that uh, that it works and it gets it's supportable. So, you know, kudos to Dynatrace for being one of our longtime partners, um, working with us to to test and integrate their software with the OpenShift platform. I think that that really helps customers be able to you know move POCs into production sooner and be more successful with you know better day two support and so forth. Having said that with my gratuitous plug for, for Dynatrace and how much we love you guys, um, why don't you get us started on the content that you have, Mike? For sure. Uh, thanks again. Thanks for the very kind words uh, leading into this. It's actually, so, I mean, it, it's easy, right? I mean, we, you know, Dynatrace is probably one of our 
closer or closest software partners we work with. I mean, I bump into Marcy at just about every event we've ever been to. And, you know, the cool thing about doing this, especially when we reached out to Marcy and said, hey, would you guys like to be part of our TV show? The answer is always yes. There, there's never like, well, let me think about it. It's like, yeah, we're on board. That sounds cool. So, Michael, why don't you talk us about your replatforming legacy packaged apps block by block with Minecraft and, and let, let's see what you got. Yeah, for sure. So um, I'm going to just go ahead and, and kind of get into it here. Uh, and, and hopefully everybody's, you know, seeing the screen. So just kind of an overview of, of you know, what, what I'm going to talk about here. And again, like I mentioned before, this was this was kind of the genesis of a, a, a couple of months of work of, of some things that was kind of like my 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 quarantine project uh, to, to to keep myself occupied when when things were um, you know not looking all that great uh, earlier in the year um, and it was really kind of a, a an interesting not exercise. They, not that they're starting to look great now, Mike. I mean, you know, and and that's why I think this is actually a really great talk for literally today. <laughs> Right, because it's something that's going to be fun. It's going to be a little lighthearted. You know, I'm going to go into the weeds just a little bit when I start talking about, you know, the the Kubernetes CPI and the CSI and stuff like that. But overall, it's basically like, how can I play a game with Kubernetes? Right. So it's a it's a fun kind of uh, uh, topic that I think is is going to be a little lighthearted, just given how uh, chaotic uh, everything is. However, while it is fun. I actually think it's relevant for some of the problems that that folks are encountering now. Uh, you know, when you are taking something that is uh, perhaps a piece of commercial off the off the shelf software, and you're trying to run that uh, in your OpenShift environment, right? So we're going to kind of talk a little bit about you know my own internal modernization journey uh, that I've taken over the the many many years that I've been providing. A number of of Minecraft instances to my to my friends to collaborate on, um, and then you know moving all of that into OCP, uh, and then kind of at the end I'm going to talk about you know tangentially related things around trying to procure hardware and stuff like that uh, when the worldwide supply chain was almost completely uh, disconnected. So there's some fun little fun little learnings there too, and and. Maybe fun isn't the right word, but you'll you'll find out more when we get to that, right? Okay, sounds good. All right, so uh, why Minecraft as an example, right? It's Java-based, which is terrific, but it's closed source, right? So this isn't a piece of, of open source software. Um, one of the things that uh, architecturally is really fascinating about Minecraft is it's a multiplayer game, but it's effectively single-threaded. All right, so what that means is everything that happens in the game is all attempting to happen in this uh, 50 millisecond tick. Uh, the, the game is designed such that uh, it tries to maintain this uh, 20 tick per second tick rate, and everything that you need to do uh, has to happen within that 50 milliseconds. And that includes all of the players on the servers, uh, on the server either placing or breaking blocks, um, what the blocks are doing, right? So is it a piece of glowstone that's lit up? Is it uh, redstone logic that is, you know, making machines do things? Um, is it, uh, you know, something in modded Minecraft, which is crazy, and that's kind of what I'm talking about today. In modded Minecraft, you have things like computers that are inside of Minecraft running Lua script. Right, some crazy person created a mod that runs inside of the Mon Minecraft JVM and actually spawns JVM virtual machines that you can control from inside of Minecraft. You know, there's another mod out there that actually lets you uh, administer your Kubernetes cluster from inside of Minecraft. You know, representing pods as uh, pigs and chickens and so on uh, inside of the Minecraft instance. It's all totally fascinating. Um, but that same 50 millisecond tick also has to um, represent what all of the uh, monsters and things like that in the game are, are doing. And I use monster to kind of mean, you know, everything from, you know, the, the typical skeletons and things like that that you encounter at night, as well as all the, 
you know, chickens and pigs and cows and stuff like that that you might see during the day. Um, one of the things that's really fascinating is with with modded Minecraft, again, this is all this extra behavior that has to still occur inside of that 50 millisecond game tick, right? Um, what happens if your actions take longer than 50 milliseconds is they start to back up and eventually they will be skipped. Um, and sometimes this can get really bad and you might end up skipping several seconds worth of changes to the game world, right? So, you know, if you're sitting here and you're down in a cave and you're breaking blocks to try and, you know, um, you know, to try and get to some diamonds or something like that or, or gold, uh, what's going to end up happening is the server will reset back to the state it was a couple of seconds ago, and all of a sudden those blocks that you broke will reappear again. Or the block that you play um, will all of a sudden disappear. Um, and it, and it right? You know, and 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 folks complain about that as as it, it viewed as lag. It's a pretty common thing. Um, everybody knows about it. Everybody kind of gripes about it. Um, the other interesting thing here as well is that this is a pretty this is kind of sort of a, a almost a worst case example for modernization because there's really significant persistent disk requirements here. So the Minecraft world itself is like several gigs, um, and you know, the access to that data needs to be pretty low latency. Um, and then you need some place to put backups as well, which are also pretty large. Um, so it's it's all, you know, you could almost think of it maybe as, as a little bit more analogous to, you know, something like a database uh, as opposed to, you know, something that's a, a perhaps a more modern application, right? So I thought it was a really great kind of example of, you know, how to mo modernize something, how to replatform something where you can't actually adjust the code and something that really barely holds it together to begin with, right? So what were my, my early steps towards modernization? All right, so the first things that I did uh, way back when, uh, this was, you know, a, a project that I undertook many, many years ago to uh, stand up a, a, a file server in my basement. I was like, okay, you know, as, as many other technologists do, I had, you know, probably 10 or 12 years worth of, you know, old defunct desktops that I was using as, you know, quote unquote servers that were either sitting in a closet or in my basement. And I decided that I wanted to consolidate all of those uh, onto one server that was like real server hardware, you know, a Xeon CPU, ECC memory, all that kind of good kind of server enterprise things. Um, so I built myself a, a server that I ran in my basement, and I had my Minecraft workload running as a virtual machine, and I was using ZFS as my file system, and I was using a number of, you know, traditional hard drives uh, to, to store that data, right? And this worked for a couple of years, um, but as modded Minecraft started to get worse and worse and all of the things that they were starting to, to, to slam into that, all of those things that were trying to happen in that 50 millisecond game loop, uh, it just it just wasn't working out, right? This is a common error message that you would see uh, when, when something like that happened, right? You'd see this error message in the log saying, can't keep up, uh, did the time change, or is the server overloaded, right? And the answer is the server is always overloaded, right? And in this case, when I mentioned before, um, the server was actually almost 24 seconds behind what was actually supposed to be happening. So when it realized when you, that, yes, sorry. Just, when, when you say ZFS, we had some people who were like throwing in some kudos to that, but like, what do you mean by spinning rust? I mean like- That's at traditional hard drives. Oh. Right, so when, when we talk about spinning rust, uh, we, we, we're, we're basically talking about traditional hard drive because the platters are metal, yeah. right? And and if hard drive actually rusts, um, that's probably bad. Um, I don't know how that would actually happen, um, but what you kind of sort of jokingly refer to, you know, old fashioned hard drives as spinning rust. I just was thinking maybe your basement was really wet and there was like puddles of water and you were off in a corner sweeping spider webs and... <laughs> Yeah, well, all those things are definitely happening, um, but again, 
this this is a more traditional phrase to refer to our old-fashioned hard drive, right? Gotcha. So uh, obviously, my basement is not a real climate-controlled data center with like you know Halon and all that other fancy stuff. So you know, it's a worst-case scenario. You know, literally having the vacuum bugs out of the servers every once in a while because it's warm and they like to go there. Um, anyways, um, yeah. you, you know, kind of. It, it, as I mentioned, but this is like a, a real example of when things bog down, the user experience is terrible because it's like the, the whatever you did for the last 24 seconds just didn't happen, right? It just rewinds that and then starts over again. And when you're in a situation like this where your hardware can't keep up, it's just going to happen over and over again, and that user experience is terrible, right? So I needed to move on from the virtual machine approach, right? So Docker started to be a thing that people were talking about. And I'm like, okay, well, Docker is a, is a nice thing to do here because it's still gonna allow me to sort of kind of isolate things from the underlying host because I really didn't want this to be running on the actual host itself because I had people from the public internet, uh, you know, connecting into my Minecraft instance. And, you know, it's a game, so it's not necessarily you know, the, the, the same type of standards that you might have for a real piece of enterprise software when it comes to security. Um, you know, the JVM does a pretty good job of handling some of that, but for the most part, um, it, it was not something that I wanted running pure bare metal, all right? But Docker got me to close to bare metal performance. There is a little bit of overhead that uh, is arguable and discussed quite frequently uh, on the internet, but, uh, Docker allowed me to have the isolation and allowed me to have near bare metal performance. Um, and then it was a lot easier for me to allow the Minecraft instance to have access to uh, an SSD that I have in the server. And then also the what I now consider slow ZFS storage uh, that I had in that server as well, right? So it allowed me to take the world itself, run that on an SSD uh, with all the great uh, benefits of that, um, but then it allowed me to use the slower and cheaper hard drives for backup, right? So I will mention as well, uh, you know, again, running things via Docker, uh, fairly traditional, uh, you know, type of implementation there, um, but I do want to kind of another, you know, make a joke, poke fun at myself, like this that's a really old way to, to do this because I was still using byte mounts because this was something that I did before we even had volumes in Docker, right? So again, as I started looking into this um, and, and kind of starting my project and, and realizing that I was ex still, still experiencing a lot of those uh, kind of issues in the environment, even when uh, I had that close to bare metal performance, um, you know, with Docker, I was still having problems. My users were complaining that there was lag. You know, anytime I had more than two people on the server at once, uh, it, it was still a pretty bad experience. So I dropped Dynatrace on it. One of the nice things about, um, you know, working for Dynatrace is I can actually deploy Dynatrace uh, in my home lab. Uh, and when, when we started kind of uh, seeing the explosion of Docker, um, having the one agent on the underlying host allowed me to automatically monitor everything that was running as a Docker container without having to figure out, you know, how to add one agent to the container file system and all that other garbage. It, it basically just worked, which was nice. I didn't have to, I didn't have to mess with it, right? But this, you know, basically what I what I did here is kind of, you know, I, I guess you could consider this step two. I, I don't know, um, but I assessed my current states to kind of see, you know, what what's the footprint of my modded Minecraft instance, right? And this is the same thing that you would kind of do uh, if you're looking to move uh, a piece of more traditional software. Um, and I could see that I was pretty much consuming an entire core, uh, just about 24 seven, you know, in a in a 12 core machine that's about six to 8%. Uh, and then we can see as well that uh, the memory utilization is crazy. Uh, and even with that much memory allocated, we still have some pretty significant uh, GC pauses uh, on occasion as well, right? So we're using almost 10 gigs of of memory uh, and in an entire core uh, of a of a 12 core CPU, right? So I had a good un sorry. Oh no, is that is that because because it's single threaded? So 
it wasn't being distributed across all the cores. That is exactly correct. Great, great observation there. Yeah, so definitely it's single threaded, so it will occasionally use more than a core uh, because it, occasionally there are things that actually run um, outside of the main tick thread. Uh, but for the most part, it's that main tick thread that, that uses all the time, right? Yeah. So the next thing that I wanted to do is I wanted to actually understand how long a tick actually takes, right? Um, and this is kind of a fascinating process uh, with with something like Minecraft because, again, looking at this like we would with a piece of commercial off-the-shelf off the software, uh, you know, we're not going to have access to the source code, right? Um, and it's even worse with Minecraft because – you know, all of the, the functions and classes and things like that are actually obfuscated, right? Because Mojang didn't want folks uh, to actually easily understand what was going on here. Um, but because Minecraft became so popular with the uh, modding community around changing how Minecraft operated and adding all this extra functionality to it, there's the mod coder pack, right? Which actually on a regular basis exports a CSV of deobfuscated function names and things like that. Um, and then additionally, I was able to use Dynatrace to actually crack um, CPU utilization, right, on a uh, kind of method by method basis. And I was able to find that this, you know, function underscore 71217P was pretty significant when it comes to um, TPU consumption, and then cross-referencing that with the mod coder pack, I found that, yes, yeah, that was basically the best representation of the master tick thread, right? So again, using Dynatrace, then I could, I could basically tell Dynatrace, hey, normally our transactions start with some sort of web request, right? That's what the, you know, most modern architectures are doing. Uh, but here's an example of something that isn't actually speaking HTTP, right? So I define an entry point manually based on that, uh, you know, function 71.27.217p, right? And now Dynatrace is going to say every time that's a, that's a new transaction, right? So that allows me to, you know, better understand the, uh, the response time uh, for those ticks and understand that uh, transaction right there. Right, and we can actually see very easily uh, here in this environment that those slowest 5% of ticks were pretty darn close to 50 milliseconds literally all the time, right? So regardless of whether or not anybody was even on the server, we were pretty close to that 50 millisecond point all the time, right? So something had to be done. Uh, I had to, you know, move this forward uh, to, to some more modern hardware. Right. So, uh, you know, what what better choice than something like OpenShift Container Platform? Right. I wanted the advantage. Right. Um, I wanted a good excuse to update my home lab. Um, I wanted to move forward from a pretty darn old Xeon uh, to take a look at, you know, our new uh, Epic Roam CPUs, which everybody was kind of talking about. It was the new hotness at the beginning of the year. Um, you know, wasn't able to go with ARM because I need quite a bit more, uh, you know, memory footprint and things like that. And I still wanted to stay in the X86 family here. Um, so hey, I ended up with, yes, yeah, sorry. My question for you, I noticed when you, when you were listing out, you know, your operating systems that you were using, you know, earlier on, you listed, um, you know, Ubuntu as, as a, as a, you know, an upstream project. Why wouldn't you use native Kubernetes for this as opposed to OpenShift? Well, um, you know, that's a that's a great question. You know, I'm actually using OpenShift because kind of my job to investigate the the, the capabilities of OpenShift um, as opposed to, you know, some of the other, um, you know, Kubernetes offerings. Um, I've made my scenario work today on other Kubernetes offerings. Um, but one of the things that I found fascinating about the process of getting this up and running on OpenShift, and I'll actually get to that in a couple of other slides, um, one of the things that I found fascinating was kind of how OpenShift is secure by default and kind of forces you to take it to, to, to do some best practices, 
right? And I actually found that out the hard way. In, in a few slides, when I actually kind of talk about my new Docker file, um, I found that what worked on other Kubernetes flavors actually didn't work on OCP. Uh, and that's because I wasn't following best practices. No. Right? So, um, you know, yeah, sorry. We are starting to get some questions coming in. Do you want to hold all questions to the end? or? Uh, I would just... love to take questions. I actually just can't see them when I'm in presentation mode. Uh, so, I'll, yeah, um, so I'll, I got this one here. So Justin asked a question a couple minutes ago. Um, he'd be very curious if any JVM optimization comes out of this to get to get rid of GC and heap size hog. Yep. Yep. So um, that's a that's a great question. Uh, where I am at now with it um, is the result of some pretty hefty uh, optimization efforts just in order to get it to run on my old hardware uh, that I haven't revisited. Um, additionally, the 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 modded Minecraft community tends to focus on older versions of Minecraft. So, for example, this is still Java 8, right? So I can't take advantage of some of the new GC capabilities and the newer JVMs. However, folks in the community have found some pretty good performance improvements moving to alternative JVMs. Um, right now I'm using, you know, um, OpenJDK. Um, and so one of the things that if time allows in the future is I want to take it, I, I want to kind of look at some of the other JVMs that have been known to work uh, to see if some of those improve things. Um, I seem to recall somebody saying that like Graal, for example, actually works really well for this. Okay, uh, just w one one last one, then I'll <clears throat> then I'll I'll stop interrupting. Um, uh, Chris wants to know, or Washari wants to know, is Michael using OCP on Ubuntu? Which version, et cetera, et cetera. U Ubuntu is the old the old platform. Right, that's the old platform. So now that I'm using OCP, right, I'm using OCP on vSphere, right, and I'm kind of talking about some of these things here because one of the things that I really found fascinating will, will be my next slide where I talk about how to get OCP running really nicely on top of vSphere. Um, but I am, since it's OCP, I've deployed 4.5.11 with the installer, right? So it's still core OS under the cover. Right. right? So Ubuntu is not a part of this. Uh, this particular deployment anymore. It's all all Red Hat all all the time, well, except for the vSphere part. But except we'll, we'll for get the to that. Vsphere part, yeah. <laughs> okay. Cool. Cool. Awesome. All right. So when it came time to build out this uh, this fancy schmancy uh, new home lab, uh, which again is a pretty it's a beefy home lab. I'm I'm not I'm not gonna lie, um, but you know, I wanted to take advantage of vSAN uh, because the, the vSAN kind of felt familiar to me based on, again, that that kind of Hadoop experience of keeping the compute and storage together. Um, so I kind of wanted to experiment with uh, so-called hyper-converged infrastructure, right? Um, and I wanted to do all flash vSAN because it's 2020, so let's, you know, take the spinning rust out of the picture. Um, and I was able to source uh, you know, vSphere is pretty particular about the hardware you use. It complains pretty heavily if you use something that's not on the hardware compatibility list. So I wanted to be certain that at the very least, uh, with all Flash vSAN, you basically have a cache drive and, you know, what's effectively the storage drive, right? Um, and I wanted to make sure at the very least that the, that the cache tier was on the HCL. So I was able to find some used uh, Intel SSD on eBay, um, and then I used kind of uh, garbage tier SSDs for uh, the capacity tier. Um, and vSphere complains about it, but it actually works. Um, and it was also an opportunity to upgrade to uh, 10 gigabit networking, uh, which which I'm going to talk about a little later too, because that was not without its challenges. Right. So I've got this fancy schmancy uh, vSAN cluster, right? So now I run run OCP on it, and this is where things kind of get fascinating because I think we're at a we're at a unique kind of threshold or, or crossroads here. I don't know if I want to say crossroads, um, but we're it, it, the Kubernetes community is kind of at an interesting point because every 
Kubernetes deployment is going to have a CPI. That's the cloud provider interface. That's what allows Kubernetes to work with all the underlying pieces of your IS, right? Uh, that's how it, you know, works with, uh, you know, the, the storage and all that kind of other thing, right? So now we have this fascinating time where you have the entry CPI, which is what part of core Kubernetes, and you have the out of tree CPI, which is something that's provided by the cloud provider, right? So in this case, VMware um, has their own out of tree CPI, which allows them to control the release cadence, right? So it's not governed by the release cadence of Kubernetes itself, it's actually managed by VMware. So they kind of control, you know, when a new release happens and they can either do that, you know, faster or slower than upstream Kubernetes, right? Uh, and then with that out of tree API, now you have this new container storage interface, right? So this is kind of a new way of abstracting the, the, the storage from the, the container orchestrator, right? And that works hand in hand with the CPI to basically provision storage, right? So when I have, when I need a Kubernetes volume and I want to dynamically uh, allocate that, uh, the, the CSI now is what's going to handle talking to vSphere and creating that new piece of storage and mounting that on all the nodes. Right, so this is kind of a new fancy way to do this uh, with, what is it, v, vSphere 6.7 U3 and beyond, I think it is. Um, I'm using vSphere 7, um, but this is basically, uh, and then you're actually going to see all those volumes in the vSphere UI as well. Uh, and vSphere will tell you, you know, which pod, you know, a lot of information around uh, how that storage is being mounted inside of Kubernetes. So it's kind of a great uh, integration piece there. Uh, and Really works uh, really well uh, inside of OCP, right? So it's not something that's in OCP out of the box. Again, because you know VMware is is responsible kind of for for distributing uh, the the CPI and the CSI, but is a fairly trivial process to get this up and running. I was actually expecting it to be more difficult uh, than it was because I I had attempted to do this with another Kubernetes offering like seven or eight months ago. I'm um, kind of uh, and, and it was something that I had a lot of difficulty with. But luckily, the community has been all over getting the new out-of-tree CPI working inside of OCP. Um, so I found some great instructions that I've, that I've linked to here. Um, I did have to make a couple of changes to the underlying VMs because the, um, the OpenShift installer creates VMs uh, with kind of an older compatibility mode for uh, vSphere. I think it was version 13, I think sounds right. Um, so I had to upgrade that. And then there's also kind of a toggle uh, that you need to enable for all the VMs, uh, which, you know, that UUID just kind of gives a little bit more context uh, uh, around which VM is mounting which piece of storage everywhere. Um, and then it's just a couple of, you know, OC commands to create secrets, to apply some manifests, um, you know, creating some roles and all those fascinating things. Uh, and then a controller and a daemon set. And then basically you're giving it uh, your vSphere information, and then that allows this new out-of-tree CPI to talk to vSphere to provision the things that you need in your cluster, right? But again, so now that I've got the uh, out-of-tree CPI deployed and I have access to the new vSphere CSI, um, it allows me to kind of uh, create new storage classes, right? So I create two storage classes, uh, one that's the vSAN flash, uh, and one that's my old spinning rust VFS exported via NFS via vSAN. So that's obviously not super performant. Um, but you can see here that it's pretty simple uh, to roll this out. You basically just give it the data store URL uh, and you're good to go, right? Uh, but I do want to call something out here pretty specifically, right? So when you're defining these storage classes, you want to make sure that you're using this new provisioner, right? CSI.vsphere.vmware.com, because if you use the Kubernetes.io one, that's 
possibly that's still going to work with OCP, uh, but that's not going to be using the new CSI stuff, right? Do so you want to make sure that uh, that you're using this this new one? And one of the interesting things is that this is all still new enough uh, that sometimes you'll find instructions referring to the old way as opposed to the new way, right? And that's the great thing about technology is if you Google things, you can find all sorts of conflicting answers. So you have to kind of use your head once in a while, right? Uh, so obviously then, uh, you know, what I was able to do here is uh, created a couple of PVCs, right? The PVCs are uh, what's going to allow those uh, volumes to get created dynamically uh, because ain't nobody got time to reprovision storage. That just sounds crazy to me, and that's not why I moved to Kubernetes. Um, so this allows me to, to basically just let all that underlying tech provision the storage for me. I just tell Kubernetes what I need. Right, I need 20 gigs of fast storage, and I need 100 gigs of slow storage. Kubernetes, you go figure that out for me. And it did. It was great. Right. So those persistent volumes, they get mounted as volumes in my deployment. Right. So in my manifest for my app, I just say, hey, take that, uh, take that world claim, which was the fast storage, and mount that as the Minecraft data volume. And I want you to put that in home Minecraft Animatica 2 world, right? Uh, that's actually old. I thought I changed that, but I had actually moved that mount path to uh, slash data slash Animatica 2. Um, and you'll see that uh, when I show my uh, new Docker file here in a second. Um, but so basically what's going to happen here is the same way that I did things in, in Docker. Uh, I've now basically got this storage that needs to be persistent uh, mounted at that file system path inside of my inside of my pod, right? Right. So again, uh, as you mentioned and asked me earlier, like you know, why use OCP for this stuff? Uh, one of the other really interesting things that I encountered as I was kind of going through this is, you know, what what I had done and what I had experimented with uh, on some other Kubernetes distributions didn't actually work uh, in OCP. Um, and, and that's because, you know, so many things are kind of secure by default uh, with OCP. I had a lot of, you know, uh, file system errors due to the way that a random, U, uh, random UID gets assigned to the, the process that's running inside of the container. Um, so I had to fight that a little bit. Um, and I'm sure there maybe is a better way to do this, but what I did is I just, 775 all the files that my process needs to have access to uh, and and that kind of got me through it um, but as a part of this you know again revisiting my docker file actually resulted in me you know having some other best practices and so on and I went from don't laugh at me I went from a 1.8 gig docker file or you know docker image down to a 600 meg docker image and 600 megs is about as good as it's going to get because the the unzipped server files uh, are actually about that big. Um, and again, this is something where you know I'm actually using the upstream uh, OpenJDK image. Um, and as I kind of experiment with some other you know uh, JVMs and things like that, I might start to experiment with that a little bit more. Uh, but for now, this works uh, and and simple as best. Uh, when it comes to when it comes to things like that, right? And then if we look at the deployment in full, uh, there's a couple of interesting things that I I know want to call out here, right? This is a monolith that you you can't scale it out. Um, like if we went back, you know, we'd see that uh, the PVC is read write once, um, and that's because we we can't have multiple processes writing to the same storage. It's you know basically one replica and and that's it. We 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 can't scale this one out. You can scale it up, which is kind of sort of what I did here by by getting, getting some new hardware, uh, but you can't scale that out in that instance, right? Pardon and me. and I'd love. Sorry, yeah. Pardon me, Michael. Frank had a question about storage. He he wanted to know, is there a command to query the available storage provisions in an OCP cluster uh, storage provisioners? Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, you can you can actually do an OC get SD to actually list the storage classes. Um, you can do the same thing to to, to get the persistent volumes as well. Um, or if you're old-fashioned, or 
you know, maybe a little bit more used to uh, cube control, you can do the same thing with cube control. And, and I, I would also say for, I, I'm, not an, I'm not an OCP expert by any stretch of the means, but I do work at Red Hat, and I, Michael Waite, it's just, it's just Waite at RedHat.com, W-A-I-T-E at RedHat.com. I can get you connected with just about anyone you'd ever want to, you know, talk to on the, uh, on the OpenShift uh, team. Awesome. Great. Well, you know, I, I am, may not have some, some questions as a result of things that I've uh, kind of experienced throughout this as well. That was, uh, again, that was for the attendees, Michael, you're going to have to go through Marcy. Sorry. Okay. That's fine too. <laughs> yep. And, and, and obviously I'm making all my own friends at, at, at Red Hat as well. So like, <laughs> you know, uh, talking to Kevin Bear and things like that. So um, I'm sure I can get my own answers. <laughs> Right. So, so as I look at my uh, my my deployment manifest here, you know, there's a couple of other things that I can improve. Uh, you know, some of the environment variables might be nice to be in a config map or something like that, uh, or or maybe even as a secret because you know, for example, the default op is sort of kind of secret. Like maybe that would be better served in a secret. Uh, one of the other interesting things that I had to do recently as well was. Uh, you'll see this manifest is actually just uh, kind of a standard Docker Hub uh, type of image. Um, I, I did move to uh, temporarily move to Harbor because uh, I have a Harbor instance running in my basement, um, but I think I might, you know, make that an image stream uh, as well, just due to all the changes that have happened with uh, Docker and, you know, only being able to fetch a certain number of images per hour or whatever it is and, and, if things don't get accessed in a while, they get deleted. Um, so I'm kind of experimenting with with some other ways to uh, to deal with that. Um, so I did use Harbor um, as I was rapidly iterating over this. Um, the very first image that I created was, you know, 1.77 with no letter. So obviously the fact that I'm on F now uh, means that I had to iterate over my images a couple of times before I got something that uh, I liked the way it worked, right? All right, awesome. So, so now I've got that manifest all set up, uh, and then I basically get a JVM that nobody can access from outside of the cluster. Uh, and since this is a multiplayer game server, by itself, it's not really doing anything valuable uh, without being able to connect to it. Um, so I experimented with a, with a couple of different things here, um, but you know our kind of normal ingress controllers with you know, HA proxy and stuff like that don't necessarily make sense here because Minecraft is an HTTP, so it's not really gonna work that way. Um, I'm deploying this to my basement, so it's not sitting on, you know, GCP, AWS, Azure, and so on, so I don't have a real load balancer yet. I'm sort of kind of thinking about trying to buy an F5 from eBay or something like that, um, but I don't have a real load balancer yet. Um, so I use uh, Metal LB. Uh, Metal LB is, you know, pretty much the kind of thing that, that folks use in this type of scenario. Um, as I got through what I was doing here, um, I did find that uh, somebody actually built, somebody at Red Hat uh, built an operator uh, to manage this. Um, and that was actually something that I didn't see until yesterday evening. Um, so I'm actually looking to perhaps rip out what I've done here and replace it with that. Uh, but for now, um, I've got Metal LB set up to uh, use a bunch of IPs from my private LAN, um, and then I just provision access to those uh, via NAT uh, on my on my home's router. Um, I do want to call one thing out because I get to do these types of talks quite a bit, which gives me an opportunity to hop on a soapbox. And you know how much people in tech like to get on soapboxes. Uh, don't actually do this. Um, I <laughs> included this as an example, uh, but I really, really hate uh, when when people just cube control apply a, a, a file directly from GitHub or a file from the internet or uh, you know piping curl the back or whatever. Um, what, we always include that in our directions as like tech companies and so on. But what we really hope is we really hope somebody actually downloads that file and looks at it first before they apply it to their right. cluster. Yeah. Right. So I've got that, you know, it's it's written this way for, you know, to make things nice and concise. 
right? But let's 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 not actually do this uh, anymore. Like it's just not good. All right. So again, as I mentioned before, I've got that load balancer uh, available, uh, making those requests to Minecraft available via a private IP. Uh, so then I just use my uh, ubiqui ubiquity edge router uh, to provide access uh, to that port via NAT. Um, and if anybody has any questions about ubiquity hardware, uh, please let me know as well, uh, as everybody is doing the same thing as me and upgrading their, their home networks. Uh, some of my some of my friends at VMware have have started to do this with with Ubiquity hardware, and I'm a huge fan. So uh, I'll leave that one out there as well. Right. So one of the other things we'll we'll talk about here, and we're we're almost done, um, is Kubernetes requests and limits. Right. So as we take a legacy application and we want to move it into a cluster like this, that is hopefully going to be doing more uh, than just running something like Minecraft. You want to make sure that all these things uh, live together nicely, and you want to make sure that Kubernetes is able to uh, place the workloads on the nodes that can actually support that workload, right? So one of the fascinating things here, especially since a lot of other folks uh, have been using the quarantine to build clusters of Raspberry Pis and things like that, uh, since Minecraft requires so much memory, you know, I've got to go out there and I've got to say, hey, I, I need at least 11 gigs and I want to limit this to 12, right? So what that means is if my cluster of all my worker nodes are eight gig worker nodes, this will never deploy because the scheduler is never going to find a node to run it on. So I needed to have, uh, you know, extra large worker nodes here. Um, the nice thing about the OpenShift installer is the default node size is perfect here, right? Because the default node size is, uh, I think, four cores and 16 gigs of memory that was perfect for my need, right? Uh, the interesting thing then when we start to talk about requests, right, which is what the scheduler uses to place workloads versus limits is if you have your limit set in a certain way, uh, if you have your memory limit set and you exceed that, it's gonna kill your pod, right? And if your CPU limit is hit, it's just gonna slow it down, right? The nice thing here is that obviously, again, I work for Dynatrace, so I'm using Dynatrace in my Kubernetes environments. Um, I'm actually utilizing our uh, Red Hat certified operator to, to monitor these workloads. Um, and with that one deployment into my cluster, I can now monitor this the same way that I did back in the Docker world. And now I can also track uh, my CPU throttle, right? So if I got- how is that operator working out? Is that is that a, is that a Helm chart or is that a real operator? Or? Technically, it's both uh, because there is a Helm chart that will deploy the operator, right? So you know it's hurdles all the way down, um, and what that operator is going to do for us is just the traditional operator benefits, right, of codifying all that knowledge around deploying one agent to a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, and again, to what you talked about kind of in the beginning, uh, Dynatrace has been working really closely with Red Hat kind of since day one of the operator framework. Right. Um, you know, and it has been jointly certified and it's jointly supported by by both of our organizations. Um, but what the operator is doing is it's actually rolling the one agent out to all your worker nodes. Right. And once the one agent is on the worker node, it's going to automatically inject into every application, every pod uh, on that uh, OCP environment. Right. Cool. That makes, and then, that makes for configuration management a lot easier. So you don't, have, especially on the larger the clusters get, right? Oh, for sure, for sure. There's no need to mess with, you know, sidecars or you know, pumping APM agents into your Docker file or any of those other kind of shenanigans. Um, it's just there, part of the platform, watching everything, right? Um, and again, what's fascinating about this is just because the application doesn't speak HTTP, um, we can monitor that too, right? You just have to tell it what represents the transaction, right? Um, but in this context as well now, I'm able to validate that my replatforming efforts were successful and that I've set these uh, limits to a sane value because I can start to see if their CPU throttling occurred, right? So in this particular screenshot, I can see that there was 
quite a bit of CPU throttling occurring, right? So that's what kind of got me to the point where I was starting to bump uh, that limit up, right? Because based on what I saw earlier, I was like, oh, okay, like a core and a half should be fine. So it was set to 1500M, um, but I needed to increase that to, to two entire cores. All right, so the current state, everything is great. Uh, I've got a nice little chart there at the bottom. That's the that's the, uh, the the master tick thread response time for the new environment in Teal, I think that is. I'm not great with colors. Um, and then the orange one, uh, is the is the old instance. Now the old instance doesn't have anybody on it anymore. So that's basically 15 milliseconds with nobody on it. Uh, and the new instance down below was like seven and a half, you know, five to seven and a half milliseconds uh, with uh, a handful of folks on it, right? Uh, and now I'm going to be alerted uh, by Dynatrace if that response time is ever degraded. Uh, and then I can do cool things like, you know, dive into the methods that are part of the master tick thread that are causing trouble. Like for example, I, I did have a problem uh, a couple of weeks ago uh, and I was able to use Dynatrace to find out that the root cause of my problem was frog. I had frogs in my Minecraft world that were added by a mod called Quark. Uh, and for whatever reason, the AI responsible for governing the, the frog behavior was acting up uh, and it was taking like 80% of that master tick thread so as the Minecraft admin, I had to hop onto my server and kill all the frogs in the entire world. So uh, that was kind of an interesting kind of example, right? So, you know, we've only got a couple of minutes left here because um, we've got a couple of great questions kind of along the way. Um, some of the things that were fascinating about this whole process was uh, sourcing hardware. You know, I started this effort, you know, kind of back in March. Uh, and, and sourcing hardware when all this stuff was going down uh, back at the beginning of the year was was really difficult. Um, and even though I was buying like real legit server grade hardware, I still had a, a, a fascinating amount of hardware problems. Like I had a DOA CPU that took a month and a half to get a replacement. Um, I actually had Unrelated, I had a CPU socket that actually melted, uh, taking yet another CPU with it. Um, and for the first time in 20 years, um, I had bad cabling uh, that was negatively impacting things. And, and oddly enough, it was not cables that I built. Uh, it's actually cables that uh, were, were pre-made. Uh, so 10 gigabit networking, even for like a short two meter cable, uh, was still really picky uh, uh, about uh, cable quality. Um, and then again, I, wa I wanna call this out. This is my Docker file, right? There's many Docker files out there, but this one is mine. Uh, it's probably not the best. Uh, there actually is a Red Hat example about this that I found. Um, and it uses this uh, itsg uh, Minecraft server Docker file. Uh, and itsg also has some more generic uh, ways of deploying Minecraft as a stateful set and so on. Um, but he's got some weird things going on in his Docker file and I wanted to kind of simplify to the max. Um, so I wanted something that I would definitely understand throughout the process, um, but I will probably migrate this uh, to, to that Docker file because it's, it's a lot more advanced and it has some capabilities that I'm missing, right? Um, if anybody has any questions about this or wants to hop on uh, the Discord where I have the server information, uh, please DM me on Twitter, uh, at Mike Villager. Um, we've got a couple of different uh, kind of Red Hat related uh, call to actions here. Um, the cool thing about Dynatrace is Dynatrace and Red Hat have been, you know, working together very closely for quite some time now. So we are listed on the Red Hat marketplace. So you can initiate a free trial via the marketplace or you can buy Dynatrace uh, via the marketplace as well. Um, the link on the left uh, is a white paper that, that we've kind of created mm -hmm. that similar to what I talked about here today, and it's about you know, how Dynatrace in, uh, can help you accelerate your migration uh, to OpenShift. And then we've got a customer story uh, available on the right, uh, where we talk about some of the things that we were able to do uh, to help the modernization efforts at Porsche, uh, which is a brand that I'm a big fan of. Um, and that is the end of my content. Well, I, I have a question for you, Michael. We've of got, course. We've got a minute and a half left. 
So what if what if what if someone doesn't work at Dynatrace and they don't have access to a beefy home lab, kind of like you know what you've illustrated how you put together? How do people replatform their apps? I mean, so so there's a couple of key kind of like in a 90 second overview here, like just a real high level point. So. You want to monitor your existing application to understand what the footprint of that app is to, and, and, and also, if possible, understand the dependencies for that application, right? Uh, and then, you know, have some place to put the app, right? Uh, and then you want to make sure that you are utilizing something, hopefully Dynatrace, to, to, to understand that effort has not been for naught. Uh, that that things are actually working great throughout that replatforming or migration process, uh, because if you kind of go through this effort and end up pissing all your users off, like that's really no fun for anybody. Not sure if no. I answered that question, I, but I, I think that I think that's I think that's fairly good. I mean, I, I kind of sprung that on you here with with literally seconds left, but I just kind of wanted to kind of wanted to toss that one in there. This awesome. has been really cool. So. Um, Again, if people want to get connected with your Minecraft instance, you want them to reach out to you on Twitter? Yep, that's at Mike Villager, and it's V-I-L-L-I-G-E-R. So it's -I like Village, but it's an I, not an A. All right. Well, hey, this has been probably one of the more unique shows we've done here. I, I uh, thank you so much for uh, for putting that together. and, and I don't even want to ask, you know, what your investment is in your in your home lab, but uh, yeah, don't tell my um, wife either. No. <laughs> Anyways, thanks for coming. Saw you had sorry you had to go in there and kill all the frogs, uh, but someone someone had to do it, you know. And it, to make an omelet, you got to kill some frogs. It is life. <laughs> thanks again, Michael Villager from Dynatrace, being here on our on our OpenShift Commons briefings. Operator Hours show. My name is Mike Waite, and we're going to close it out here for the day. And um, thanks, everyone, for coming.